Throughout your studies, you are going to learn a series of techniques or methods which you can use to conduct an objective assessment of your patient or client. These methods and their associated outcomes might relate to your patient's or client's strength, balance or function. For example, in this lecture, we will discuss one such method for assessing joint-specific range of motion called goniometry. The root of the word goniometry, namely gonio, means angle, while metry means to measure. Range of motion availability is one potentially important part of the patient examination because it defines the constraints within which the clinician must work. It helps the clinician to identify abnormalities or aberrancies that may increase the risk of injury, prevent recovery or undermine function. Range of motion or the motion that occurs at your shoulder during movements of the arm or your hip during movements of the thigh or your ribs during breathing are comprised of two kinds of sub-movements, osteokinematic movements and arthrokinematic movements. Osteokinematics are the movements of the bone shafts, like the movement of the shaft at the humerus during shoulder flexion or abduction. Arthrokinematics are a little more subtle. These are the movements of the joint surfaces. In the human body, glides, spins and rolls usually occur in combination with each other between the surfaces of our joints, and these arthrokinematic motions allow for movement of bone shafts. There are generally considered to be three kinds of arthrokinematic motions. A roll is a rotatory movement, one bone rolling on another. A spin is a rotatory movement, one bone spinning on another. A slide is a gliding movement, one bone moving across another. When we assess range of motion, it can be either active or passive. An assessment of active range of motion involves little or no assistance from the examiner to move the joint in the desired way. An assessment of active range of motion provides information on a person's willingness to move, their coordination, their muscle strength, in addition to their joint range of motion. In contrast, an assessment of passive range of motion involves the examiner moving the joint into the desired position, or the examiner assisting the patient in doing so. An assessment of passive range of motion provides information on the integrity of the articular surfaces and the extensibility of the joint capsule, the associated ligaments, muscles, fascia and skin. The end of each motion at each joint is limited from further movement by particular anatomical structures. The type of structure that limits the joint has a characteristic feel, which may be detected by the therapist performing passive range of motion assessment. This feeling, which is experienced by the therapist as resistance or a barrier to further motion, is called end feel. End feel is the sensation or feeling when the joint is at the end of its available range of motion. An appropriate assessment of end feel can support the examiner in assessing pathology, identifying the limiting structures to motion at a joint, which could inform treatment and to determine prognosis or the severity of a pathology. The most widely recognized classification, which was developed by Siriex et al, has described a variety of normal and abnormal end fields. The normal end fields are generally described as hard, such as the sensation of bone to bone, like during elbow extension, soft, where there is a yielding compression or a mushy feel that stops further movement. Examples are elbow and knee flexion, which movement stopped by compression of the soft tissues, primarily the muscles. And finally, we have a firm end feel, where there is a springy type of movement with only slight give, like during end range ankle dorsiflexion. The abnormal end feels are generally described as an end feel that occurs sooner or later in the range of motion than is usual or in a joint where that end feel would not be expected. In addition to the soft, hard and firm types, an abnormal end feel can also be empty, where there is no real end because pain prevents the individual from reaching the end of range of motion. No resistance is felt except for the patient's protective muscle splinting or muscle spasm. In part two, we will outline how to conduct a goniometric assessment. 
There are many ways to conduct an assessment of range of motion. An examiner may choose a particular instrument based on the purpose of the measurement, whether it's for clinical purposes or for research, the motion being measured, and the instrument's accuracy, availability, cost, ease of use, and size. This could range from costly and time-consuming but very accurate techniques, such as with a 3D motion analysis system or an electrogoniometer, to more clinically applicable techniques, such as a simple tape measure or a goniometer itself. It is the goniometric method on which we will focus in this lecture. Goniometers come in many shapes and sizes, and you will get to use these during your practical class. We had previously discussed about making our assessments as valid and reliable as possible. To maximise validity and reliability, I will outline an assessment rubric that you can use when conducting a goniometric assessment. The following measures should be recorded and held consistent between assessments conducted by different examiners or by the same examiner conducting serial range of motion assessments. However, before we discuss the rubric, you must first communicate with your patient, outline the purpose of the assessment, why and how you are conducting it, and give them an opportunity to ask any questions they may have. Perhaps most importantly, you need to make sure that there are no contraindications to assessment, such as active inflammation, pain, instability, or recent trauma, such as a sporting injury. Now that rubric. You will see a demonstration video of an examiner conducting a goniometric assessment of the elbow. The first part of the rubric is the patient's position. In this case, the patient is in a supine position. Next, the start position of the joint being assessed. In this case, the elbow is in an extended position as determined by a hard end feel. Then the end position, which for the elbow is full flexion as determined by a soft end feel. The plane of motion being assessed is the sagittal plane in this example, and the axis of the goniometer is defined by the anatomical landmarks, such as the lateral epicondyle of the elbow. It is also important to record how the arms of the goniometer are defined, such as the stationary arm, the moving arm, or the proximal and distal arms. In this case, the proximal arm is the humerus, defined by a line drawn from the acromioclavicular joint and the lateral epicondyle of the elbow. And the distal arm is the forearm, which was defined by a line drawn from the ulnar styloid process and the lateral epicondyle. Finally, any stabilization of joint segments that you undertake should be recorded. During your practical class, you will have the opportunity to apply this rubric and to assess range of motion at a variety of joints, including the shoulder, elbow, wrist, hand, hip, knee, ankle, and foot. And that concludes this lecture on goniometry. In this class, we outlined the background and rationale for conducting a goniometric assessment and then discussed a method of assessment. This lecture was prepared for students enrolled in the UCD School of Public Health, Physiotherapy and Sports Science. Images were taken from the complete anatomy software prepared by 3D4 Medical.